Welcome to Church Online. I am so excited that you have joined us this morning. I'm Pastor Matt. I pray that our worship will be exciting and uplifting. I pray that the ministry of the Word will work in your heart and that the Lord will do something special. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the service. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about this message. We're on uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. If you have, uh, they're not in the... Uh, Bill, they're not, I didn't put them in the screen for today, Uh, but Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20, uh, is where we'll start. We're we're several weeks into this, and just for for sake of review, what we have is uh, really a very unique situation with this prophet. Most of the prophets are receiving a message from the Lord and carrying that message to the people, right? Right? Uh, Of the 12, that's predominantly how it works. They receive a message from the Lord and they carry it to the people. Many times it's a, I'm sorry, were the teens dismissing today? No, No. okay. Uh, No, that's right, tell them, say no. That's a cutie right there, that's a cutie. Uh, But receiving a message from the Lord, carrying it to the people. And what we find is, is that this prophet was different. This prophet was hearing a message, hearing a cry from the people and carrying it to the Lord. Is there there a prophet that we can track with more in 2022? Is there a message that we can track with more? Looking around at, at our world and the state of affairs and how things have been affected through a pandemic, through unrest right now, through rumors of wars... So many things that are happening, and listen, this is nothing new. Scripture says there's nothing new under the sun. This is going to continue until Jesus comes back. It's going to continue until, uh, look, the enemy has been strangled and thrown into the pit. We're going to deal with these things. But I, I think that there's just sometimes you read a passage of Scripture and you're like, man, I can really track with that. And that's how this has been for me. I've seen this prophet go, this is not what it's supposed to be like. There's this community of Jerusalem that has a rich uh, heritage of spirituality, a rich heritage of what the temple means, and look at what our leaders are doing to it. Look at what we thought King Asa uh, uh, or uh, Josiah could turn it around and only for his sons to do the same thing. Only for them to desecrate the temple. Only for them to sacrifice their firstborns. Running away from the Lord. It should be different in God's holy city. Remember, it was really about geography for these folks. When when you talked about uh, the Lord, you were talking about the land. You were talking about a specific location and all those other places are disinherited nations. Nations that had been given over, our nation was supposed to be different. (laughs) Sound familiar? Our nation is different. Our nation is a Christian nation founded on biblical principles. Does that sound familiar? At this point, we've seen God's grace extend to America, extend to the fact that we're here worshiping without fear, unlike our brothers in Canada. Isn't that crazy? I mean, look at what's happening, but, but what is our posture? What is our posture towards these horrific things that happen? You see, here's our current posture. We're spoiled. We're spoiled rotten. We, we have literally, if, if you were to be uh, compared with another Christian from another nation, I, I saw a text come across about praying for missionaries in Ukraine today. It's the same God, Right? It is. But they're faced with a much different set of circumstances than we are today. Our fear, which would be a fear, is maybe getting in a car accident on the way to church. What a difference. What a difference. And we can choose to be uh, in our place with our blinders up where we don't really care or have empathy for the rest of the world and what they're going through. And mind you, if we would broaden our scope a little bit to see what others are going through, maybe we would feel differently about what we're going through. Maybe we would feel differently about what the Lord is leading us through. You see, there's a message of the Apostle Paul. It's through all of his 13 letters. It's called unity. 
It's this idea that the church is bigger than you and I individually. It's about the collective. It's about the whole. It's about what God is doing to bring his kingdom to earth. Not our kingdom. But see, we get really focused on building these little mini kingdoms, don't we? These little mini castles, and really what they are is they're sand castles. When you look at the grand scheme of what God is doing, when you look in the grand scheme of the last 2,000 years of leaders rising up and falling, really by the time it gets to us and we're building our little constructs of what we think matter, they're sand castles in the grand scheme of things. So when we have an opportunity like this in Scripture to see a prophet go, I'm looking at what's around me and I'm taking my cry to the Lord, this is something that resonates with me. Sometimes it's hard to read the Old Testament and it resonate. Can anybody agree and track with that? Sometimes you're like, ooh, that's weird. <laughs> Has anybody ever said that reading the Old Testament? That's strange. If you haven't, you haven't read enough. There's some weird stuff in there, isn't there, Mr. Martin? Some strange things. <laughs> Stranger things. Started in the Bible. Mm. But we have to get a, a feel for what's happening in our culture. If we disconnect from it, we're literally doing the opposite of what Jesus did. And so I think today we're going to connect what the prophet was doing with what our Savior did with what we should be doing. How many are just glad things are opening back up a little bit around here? Y'all look like you need a, a, an intermission from that weighty introduction. <laughs> How many are just thankful that they don't have to wear face masks as much? I'm, I'm not saying that somebody's thankful. I just, I, Kayla, I think I just broke your headphones. I'm sorry. I'm just thankful. We were, what was it last week we were praying, babe? It's like last week we were praying and Ross was like, sometimes we share the prayer responsibilities at the dinner table. Uh, I, I think that you all should have dinner as a family around the dinner table. Those are great memories to make uh, with your children and we do that as much as we can. It doesn't always happen, but we try, we try to make it a habit. And so when we pray, many, many times they'll be like, Dad, can I pray? I'm like, sure, you pray, and so they, it's funny the way that they're all, uh, all of our prayers have started to sound the same, but I think, I think it was last week he said, uh, and uh, uh, Lord, I pray that sin would get COVID. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, like, what in the world? These kids, the way they think has been shaped by the pandemic. Consider a child walking up to a child what you used to be like, hi, they never experienced that for like two years. <laughs> Doesn't have the same effect, does it? It's kind of there-ish <laughs> versus, but, but that's kind of what, what they're living with. And when it comes to like sin and if the, prophet, <laughs> if the prophet was living today, I think his words would be similar to my son. I pray that sin would get COVID, right? <laughs> so funny. The way they think and the way that they process things. Uh, and yes, I agree with them. How many agree? Sin should get COVID and absolutely die. But it's important how we view what's happening in our world and in our culture. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a journey back in time. Remember what's happening. He believes that the Lord should spare them. In his first prayer we did uh, two weeks ago, his first exchange with the Lord, Habakkuk's, uh, you know, laying it out to the Lord, his first prayer, and then there was a response from Yahweh. And then the second prayer, and then there was a response from Yahweh. And, and by this point in the conversation, he's saying, I get it. He, he's saying, I understand. And, and remember, last week, we're really given marching orders that he is just to live by faith. And that's what really unlocked this whole book for me. I'm like, Lord, you're telling a prophet in the Old Testament, probably 700 years before Jesus even gets there, just live by faith. Wait, you're telling the people of God that, that got their manna in the morning and they said, I, I'd like a little bit more, God. It, it's not enough to have a miracle of whatever that thing was, probably a potato, land in your front yard, food for the day. They said, yeah, we want meat too, Lord. Come on, what do we look like? And he says, okay, here's quail. These are people that have seen the Lord do things. These, these are people that have seen battles that were uh, literally uh, unwinnable. And they, they would win them. And the Lord tells the, the prophet, he says, listen to me, this isn't about what you see, even though that's the content of your prayer, it's about what you don't see. It's about living by faith. Well, that should resonate with us. And so 
we make our way into this passage here of Habakkuk chapter two, and we're gonna go uh, six, verse six, through verse 20, uh, but here's what we're gonna see. This is what we call the five woes, and your study Bible probably says this. Uh, this is a portion of scripture where it talks about the five woes. Remember, the Lord is going to use providentially, sovereignly, he's going to use Babylon, the Chaldeans, to judge Jerusalem. That's what's going to happen. It's absolutely gonna happen, and at this point, uh, the prophet has said, I don't understand why, uh, why you would allow them to win and conquer us when they're worse than we are. And God said, that's not the point. If it's ever about comparison, we're in the wrong. I'm going to say that again. If it's ever about comparison of you and the world, you're in the wrong. That was never what it was about. But the world is wrong. Those that are without Christ are wrong. Those that are without God are lost. They're, they're hopeless. It is up to us to bring that perspective. But uh, sometimes I feel like we align with the wrong. Sometimes I feel like we don't call sin for what it is, and we, we don't uh, address it in our culture at a place that produces change. So it's a, do you see the balance? Do you see the tension? And so uh, the Lord addresses that tension with the Babylonians, with the Chaldeans specifically. So we're going to move through. These are called the five woes. And as I uh, kind of package them up for you, they're there in the program. Uh, this is not good. This is, this is the enemy. These things that the prophet addresses, and we just, at Bethlehem, we, we just go through scripture here. So this is the next passage of scripture. We go through a book linearly. Uh, so when you think about this, this is literally him addressing the Chaldeans. So what that means to me is, God is saying, I get it. When God calls them out for what they are, the Babylonians, and he addresses them uh, in this passage of scripture where we talk about the five woes, he's saying, I don't condone their behavior. I condemn it. But I use their behavior and I use these wrong things to bring about my purposes. Y you see, how many know the world isn't a perfect place? Is that a news flash to somebody? Somebody not know that? Oh, darn. I thought it was perfect. <laughs> it said nobody ever, right? Everybody knows that we're in a broken world. But it's how we navigate that imperfection that really brings weight to the gospel. And that's the truth of the matter. So let's watch and see how the Lord navigates uh, through these five woes. The cycle, this is what this is, this is the cycle of oppression and injustice perpetuated by the Chaldeans. Uh, Habakkuk chapter two, verse six through eight, it says this in verse six, won't all of these take up a taunt against him with mockery and riddles about him? They will say, woe to him who amasses what is not his. How much longer, how much longer, and loads himself with goods taken in pledge? Don't miss the wording here. Verse seven, won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? Then will you become a spoil for them since you have plundered many nations. All the peoples who remain will plunder you because of the human bloodshed and violence against land, cities, and all who live in them. So that's the first set of woes. I would package one and two uh, together and I would call it this unethical economics. When the Lord addresses the enemy, it's the Chaldeans, I think it's pretty much widely accepted from scholarship that the shift now is on the Chaldeans. The prophet said, you're gonna let them come in and take us? Yes, I am. Is it because they're better than us? No, woe unto them. In other words, literally, they're, they're in destruction too. They're not gonna make it either. Is the Babylonian Empire still around? I mean, I don't know. How, how did that play out for them? How did this type of behavior play out for them? It, it didn't end well, did it? No. Look, just because you have trauma and a problem in your life doesn't mean that the law of sowing and reaping, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It does exist. The Lord is going to use these things. So we, we have to address uh, these issues specifically. Now, once again, this is the cycle of oppression and injustice perpetuated by the Chaldeans. Now, let me ask you this question. Has that cycle of oppression and injustice that the prophet and the Lord are addressing, has that continued today? <laughs> 
Do we see that today in our modern culture? Yes or no? Yeah. Does a bear do you know what in the woods? Uh Uh-huh. It still happens. It's perpetuated. So, So here's my point. What we're dealing with back then, we're still dealing with now. So that's why I think it's absolutely relevant for us to see how the Lord approaches this. Auto lock. I guess I haven't touched it in 15 minutes. Sorry about that. Getting my, my iPad straight over here. So here's what I see in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. I see unethical economics. Usury that exploits people past their point uh, of need. In this woe, we see the propensity to gain or amass from someone else's stuff. That's what's being said here, reading between the lines. The same end is found in verse 17. Seems to be inserted from the form or rhythm or meter from somewhere else. If you look at uh, the end here, verse number 8, it's like a mirror of verse 17 in the passage. When you read the Bible, you got to look at it in its context, and I found that that's very interesting. When there's an exact ending on verse 8 that there is in verse 17, I think I'm saying that right, uh, it should jump out at you. It should be a clue, like, why is that there? Well, the point of this passage is they're breaking down all of these unethical practices that the Chaldeans are doing that the Lord is saying, I don't condone these things. But uh, what's also happening here is that connection of verse 8 and verse 17 brings them together. It weaves them all together like a tapestry. In other words, these unethical, the first first and second woe is unethical economics. That is woven all the way down to woe number five, which we're going to get to. That's that's the the narrator is is a genius here in how he ties these things together. So in other words, they build on each other. So usury that exploits people's past Uh, or past people's point of need. So the Babylonians will come in, they're using extortion, they're using interest to to max people beyond what they can afford, and then when something happens and it collapses, they're not able to pay their debt. And then they become what? They become slaves. Look at verse number nine. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house to place his nest on high, to escape the grasp of disaster. You have planned shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. Verse 11, for the stones will cry out from the wall and the rafters will answer them from the woodwork. So what happens is is unjust economics leads to slave labor. Labor that was unjustly used to build something for themselves The material, I love the wording here that the the prophet says, for the stones will cry out from the wall. I wrote this, the material of life has something of a telling sign in the prophet's vision here. And here's what I said, if walls could talk. Look, we we would miss something here if we didn't apply some of these things to our own lives. I mean, I just think about credit card debt. That's the first thing that came to my mind. An application. And that's not the message, but I thought to myself, like, how many of us exploit what we have? We go far beyond our capacity to pay. And then when something happens, when the bank calls for the debt, we're unable to foot the bill, and we become slaves to our very desires. Back then, though, consider this. They were the slaves, Think about the oppression as they would come in. They would gobble up another community, another town. Why? Because their leaders were money hungry and bloodthirsty and they would consume it. Not always just by killing them, but by using them and taking advantage. This still exists today. There are still marginalized folks in our world that are taking advantage of. You probably have a cell phone created by some of them. We just choose the things that we're going to care about. Ooh, that was, probably shouldn't have brought that up. Okay, all right, we'll move on to the next one. Americans just don't want to be told about the slave labor happening in the world. I get it, right? Mm. Look, as long as my phone works. (laughs) Okay. It would be good if someone in America solved that problem and, like, made one here in the United States. 
with fair practices. That would be nice, wouldn't it? I'd spend more money for it. But you see these unjust, these woes are applicable today as they were back then. So the first thing that we see, unethical. Unethical economics leading to number two, which is the third woe, slave labor. Number four, look at verse number 12, Habakkuk chapter two, verse number 12, as we advance here through the scriptures. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed, founds a town with injustice. Is it not from the Lord of armies that the people's labor only to fuel the fire and countries exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. I put this, I, this connection I think is very interesting. Listen to this. From Micah chapter 3, verse 10, it says this. Who builds Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice? These verses implicated the Chaldeans. These verses that implicated them are echoes of what the Jewish leaders had done as well in other scriptures from other prophets. At the very point in time that the, the prophet was crying out to the Lord, I hear an echo from another prophet that's judging the nation for doing the same thing. We don't do that either, do we? We don't point fingers at the Lord for things that we really are reaping our, uh, from, from things we did, from things we sowed. Micah says that literally Israel had done the same exact thing in building Jerusalem. Here's what I see. No, the fourth, the fourth woe here. Woe unto him who builds the city with bloodshed. Here's what I see. The woe that is being heaped upon the Chaldeans is this irresponsible leadership, irresponsible leadership, defining this country that's coming in and are absolutely gonna devastate the Lord's people, what defines them is irresponsible leadership. Irresponsible leaders play a significant role in the cycle of oppression and injustice. It is for the sake of building. Or are, your, uh, or, or are your constructs constructed with an eternal purpose that contributes to the kingdom of God? Why do we get surprised when we hear about leaders building things for themselves? Why do we get surprised, and this is just a little tongue-in-cheek here, I, th I think it's interesting, uh, for some of you that follow politics, why are we surprised when these politicians are millionaires? <laughs> I mean, am I the only one? I can't believe it. Gosh darn, I thought they were doing it because they loved our nation. <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks that? Just kidding, I don't think that. These folks are postured in these positions. You, you don't think they know who just got that billion dollar contract. I think I'm going to buy some of that stock. <laughs> Why does it surprise us? I'm literally reading, Marcus, I'm reading the Old Testament. And these guys, these cats did the same stuff that, that's happening today. And my point is, is this is a cycle of injustice and oppression. For, for all of you that thought, well, America was different. Our little uh, subculture of a culture that we've created, this little bubble, it's not like that here. Yes, it is. America is not the answer for the gospel. Jesus is. Nations will always have corruption. They will always perpetuate a message of injustice, a message of oppression. It, it happened back then. It happened in Cain's day. The whole Bible, the whole story is an Exodus story. Me and Cody were talking about that this week. There's an Exodus story that will happen in this specific book next week for next week's message. It's all about us leaving. It's all about us. Salvation is us being what? Delivered. That's what the word means. Sozo, deliverance, the cycle of oppression and injustice. We can see it in our nation. We can see it in racial turmoil. People think they're better than other people. It's a cycle of injustice where people prefer themselves. It happens when you, economically, when you walk into the store and you see that person there that smells funny and you're like, Ugh. it's a cycle. You turn and walk the other way. 
because you think that your path shouldn't cross his path because you're better than them. Unfortunately, I feel like sometimes Christians become better at perpetuating the cycle of oppression and injustice rather than aligning with the one who came to break those things. Am I the only one that feels that way? (laughs) Seems to be the statement of the day. (laughs) But it's true. We see this in our own churches. God help if Bethlehem ever turns up their nose at people walking through our doors because of any reason. The moment that we prefer ourselves over others, the moment we prefer what we think is right over what someone else thinks is right, we lose. The comparison game is always a losing game. It is perpetuating a cycle of injustice and oppression. The Lord says, I weep with those who weep. I mourn with those who mourn. Man, the echoes from this passage are just as alive and well today as they were back then. Irresponsible leadership play a significant role. Here's the last one before I move into our application for today. And boy, is there an application. It's going to be a good one. Look at verse 15 right there in Habakkuk chapter 2. That was almost reminiscent of somebody else's moves, I think. We'll leave that one out. But verse 215. <laughs> Cue up my mute. Anyway. Verse 15. What? Anyway. Mm-hmm. Woe to him who gives his neighbor drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk. Once again, context is important. We, we, we get really good at weaponizing scripture. We get really good at saying, this is what this means. We've been studying this book, Mr. Mark, for several weeks. It's, it's clear that this is talking about the who? The enemy. The five woes were for them and how they're approaching their situation, even though, watch this, people don't want to hear this, but the Lord is going to use them. (laughs) God, let's keep going. For the three of you that understand what I'm saying, and that's okay, don't eisegete. Don't read one verse and say, you see there, that's what that means. No, this fits in a narrative. It fits in a story, and we're talking through this story. Woe to him who gives his neighbor drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk, don't miss this, in order to look at their nakedness, you will be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your what? Your uncircumcision. That's the point of what he's saying. I'm gonna gonna get there in just a second. Let's keep reading. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will cover your glory, for your violence against Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of animals will terrify you because of your human bloodshed and violence against the lands, cities, and all who live in them. Verse 18. What use is a carved idol after its craftsman carves it? It is only a cast image, a teacher of lies. For the one who crafts it shapes trust in it and makes worthless idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, wake up, or to the mute stone, come alive. Can it teach? Look, it may be plated with gold and silver, yet there is no breath in it all. But the Lord is in his holy temple and let the whole earth be silent in his presence. There, there's so many, I could literally just preach on that today. Look, if you take a stone, the fifth woe, just in case you're wondering, if I, if I forgot to say it, it's idolatry. That's the fifth problem. If you take a hunk of wood and you carve something out of it, you just reduced it to useless because that hunk of wood could have been a part of a table. That hunk of wood, that stone, it actually could have been a part of a foundation. And what I love here is the imagery of, uh, look, when, when Jesus comes, when his kingdom is established, the stones what? The stones cry out, even the things that have no breath will have and receive their life and their breath from the Lord Jesus Christ. But if it's the enemy, woe unto them. Because they cannot fabricate what happens naturally for the Lord. The Lord lives in the supernatural. 
You're working in nature and what you're doing, making idols. You're literally taking something that could be used for yourself and you're making it useless because we know that thing ain't got any power in it. Idolatry. We already know what their power was. Their power was the might from their armies. Their power was their pride. Their power was their ego. We already know this because we've studied it. The wickedness and idolatry that was represented in Babylon was a manifestation of the uncircumcised heart. The first exchange where you give your neighbor drink, it's to uncover their nakedness, means that you got them drunk with an intent. And here's what the, here's what the prophet is saying. When, when you were naked, what was discovered is your uncircumcision. That was a sign. Circumcision was a sign that Yahweh was your God. And so in other words, their actions, when they play out, reveal that they have a heart problem, not an action problem. They were uncircumcised. The alcohol played into the uncovering. The uncovering showed who they really were. That's the tear that the narrator is trying to show. Not, look what alcohol does. No, the point should be, look what uncircumcision does. Look what, a, look what a heart of stone does. Look what, what a life without Christ does. It just consumes upon itself. It takes things that could be useful and makes them useless. That's what happens with idolatry. Now that we've talked about the five woes of the Chaldeans, and we know their end is bitter, we know that uh, eventually they're destroyed as well, used as an agent to destroy Jerusalem. I couldn't help but make a few applications for today. And I'm not going to belabor the point. I don't have much time. But I'm actually doing pretty good, Miss Patty. Come on. We're getting there. Wait, I don't like, that's like a different one. I like, I like that one a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watch this. Why do nations relive a cycle of oppression and injustice? Does anybody know? Remember, verse 8 and verse 17 connect the woes together. Here's what I believe. And I think this is what, I think this is what the narrator is getting to. They perpetuate injustice and oppression because of idolatry. That's the, the heightened part of this message is, is idolatry. And, and what that boils down to, the uncircumcision of their heart, it means this. It's because they, they don't declare their loyalty to the one supreme being, the one true God, Yahweh. Why, did these, why were these woes pronounced against them? Because they didn't believe in God because they were their God. They had not declared their loyalty. What makes the difference? What has a chance to end the cycle of oppression and injustice? Let me help you. His name is Jesus. His name is above every name. That's what makes the difference. Let me help you today, okay? I'm gonna give you three steps this morning. Three steps to break the cycle of oppression and injustice. After reading the woes, I think it would be a woe unto us if we walked away and said, well, good thing that me message wasn't for me. <laughs> Not a Chaldean, check. Yeah, okay. Look, we got problems, church. Would you agree? No? No? Do we have problems, yes or no? Yes. We got issues. I looked in the mirror and saw the issue this morning. We got problems. How are we gonna deal with it? Look, these are three very practical things that I felt the Lord leading me in this week and I just thought I'd share them with you after I read this. And then I'm gonna tie it in with the ministry of Jesus. The first thing, three steps to break the cycle of oppression and injustice. Number one, put others first. This is gonna seem very simple, very simple. How do we end this cycle? How do we stop the perpetuating of injustice and oppression? Look. How, this is how we've always done it is not good enough anymore. We have the internet, okay? <laughs> if, if you keep fixing something the way dad showed you and your dad's not good at fixing things, it's your own fault. YouTube exists. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Someone gets me. <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry. Look, it's not an excuse anymore. We, some people just lived in ignorance for years. That doesn't work anymore. The cat's out of the bat. Ignorance isn't okay. Like, last time I checked, most of you probably have at least 10 Bibles, right? 
And there's a YouTube video on every book of the Bible. You can fact check me every week and tell me all the things that I said that were wrong because of the internet. I'm just saying, like, we, we have to do better. Here's the first thing. It's very simple. Number one, put other people first. The whole conversation of five woes got started by saying these people are manipulating the economics for their own financial gain. Look, if you want to help stop oppression, if you want to help stop injustice, if you want to help stop the enemy advancing his cause and put a stop to it in your life, just put other people first. It's amazing what will happen if you just say, can I give you that? Can I serve you? Can I just love you? I see you need something. I need it too, but I'd rather you have it than me. That's so foreign. We're in this like pecking system where, no, I did that so I can take two or three more things before I give another thing away. That's what we do. That's not Christianity. That's not ending the cycle of oppression and injustice. The cycle of oppression and injustice is always, how do I get one over on them? And scripture says this, the book of Proverbs, kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord. <laughs> we only loan money to people that we know we're gonna what? Come on now, we only loan to people that we know we're gonna get it what? Back. I'll give it to you, because you know that eventually they got the means to cash the check. Here you go, and it was like your thing. It was like your good deed. Oh, you lent them the money. Here you are. What about giving money to people who you know can't pay you back? That's a loan to the Lord. What? To the Lord, you make really bad loans. Really bad. You need Dave Ramsey, Lord. You really do. That's a really bad financial move, Jesus. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Number one, number one, put others first. A loan to the poor is a loan to the Lord. We need to hear this. Maybe we would do more missions work. Maybe we would do more for the cause of Christ down here if we would put others first. And when I say maybe, I mean exactly, yes, emphatically. Look, how do I end this cycle? Put others first. Number two, pray for your leaders. Really bad leaders were in those woes. And the, and, and the command and, and like the, the judgment coming down on them because they were really bad people, right, were happening. But we all know that we have leaders that are over us that do the same stuff. So how do we act to that? Do we kick and scream, oh, you're, you're immoral and worldly and ah. Paul, <laughs> that was kicking and screaming just in case you were wondering. <laughs> My point is this. I don't know what my point is. We're still dealing with it today. So what do we do about it? We pray for them. Here's a verse for you. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings, and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. I can't believe unsafe people are making horrible decisions. And the same goes for you people deifying horrible leaders. That's God's man. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not a good man. He's not a Christian. He's not a believer. He does bad things. So, so don't be upset when immoral bad people do immoral bad things. It's par for the course. What you can do is what? Pray for him. What you can do is know that scripture says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. But see, we're really, we're a lot, if we were as good at praying as we were at criticizing, watch out, son. Literally everyone would get saved. If, if the church would become as good at praying as they are at being critical, man, there would be a wave of Holy Ghost revival. Son. You know what this one is? <laughs> I'm doing all kinds of new ones today. Pray for your leaders in just this oppression. Have you prayed for them? We know they're unsaved. We're not looking. Our hope is not in our leaders. It's in the Lord. Okay. Everyone take a deep breath right now. <gasps> oh, breathing exercise. How many have an Apple Watch that tells you to breathe? That's our problem right here. You Android lovers, get right with the Lord. Number three, and you know I mean that with... <laughs> 
in the deepest parts of me here. Number three, spiritual priorities rather than cycles of idolatry. Look, here's how do we end the cycle of oppression and injustice? Put someone else before yourself. Pray for your leaders. And number three, spiritual priorities rather than cycles of idolatry. Here's what Matthew says. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What do we see through the lens of the prophet's lament? What is it that the children of Israel and the Chaldeans had in common? What is it? Habakkuk 2.4. It says this. Look, his ego is inflated, the Chaldeans. He is without integrity, the Chaldeans, and Jerusalem. But the righteous one will live by faith. Christ's followers will live by faith, and the world will continue to live for themselves. Their ego, for their consumption, not for his good and his glory. We have to put spiritual priorities in order rather than cycles of idolatry. Here's what I'm getting at. I believe that the problem, I believe that the problem with the Chaldeans was the same problem that Israel had, their ego. Only by pride comes what? Contention, scripture says. Spiritual priorities put in order is an example of what Jesus did. What motivates you, church? It's about to get real. What motivates you? Why are you here? Could it be that we even perpetuate oppression and injustice within the church? Could it be that within the church we're not actually living out of a Holy Spirit movement and we're living for ourselves? Has anyone ever heard of scriptures or people in the Bible that were spiritual people but they weren't Jesus people? Does anybody know what they were called? Huh? Pharisees. Yeah. Jesus was never enough for the Pharisees. <laughs> Look, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, I'd go to church if it wasn't for all those hypocrites. <laughs> and that's hypocritical in just saying that, right? So I'm not siding with them. I'm just saying we all know that it's like, it's a thing. And it will always be a thing until Jesus comes back. But I really, listen, I really don't want it to be a thing here. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing to hear about it and see it. It's another thing to experience it here. Ugh. Oh, we, we need to work hard at being the church that's known for doing things for others and putting ourselves last. We, we need to work hard at leading with love. We need to work hard at knowing that's a church that prays for people that they don't agree with. That's a church that if you come through the door, they're going to love you. They're going to wrap their arms. It doesn't matter. That's a multicultural church. There's people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different uh, places in society, and they all come together, and they all love each other. That's what we want. That doesn't exist in the narrative of the five woes, and unfortunately, that exists in the church today. we got to chase that junk out. Listen to this. Matthew 16, 5 through 12. The five disciples reached the other shore. This is kind of funny. And they'd forgotten to take the bread. Then Jesus told them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were discussing amongst themselves, we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> we didn't bring any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you discussing amongst yourselves that you don't have any bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000 of how many baskets you collected? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 of how many large baskets you collected? Why is it that you don't understand that when I told you, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it wasn't about bread? Then they understood that he had not told them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The story goes like this. Jesus gets to the other side after the feeding of the 5,000, and he goes, man, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples were like, were we supposed to bring bread? We forgot to bring bread. <laughs> He's like, I'm not talking about bread, knuckleheads, but we just had the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus. Dummies. I could just see him like, getting all frustrated with them. Jesus is like, it's an analogy. You know, like a little leaven, it makes the whole lump, lump it makes the whole piece of bread get big. In other words, if you tolerate 
and you allow the Pharisees' philosophy to come into what you're trying to do for me, it's not going to what? It's not going to work. Just a few short verses later, just a few chapters later, two to be exact, listen to this, Matthew 18, 1 through 5. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, so who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? (laughs) Where's the bread at? (laughs) Should we just ask that? Where's the bread, guys? He just told you that the leaven, it wasn't about the bread. And here you are two chapters later saying, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And we know that these guys were like, is it me? I'm going to sit on his right hand. We know these poor fellows, they didn't really have too much of a clue. And they were arguing over who was the greatest. So who's the greatest? And he called, Jesus called a small child, and he had him stand among them. Truly, I tell you, unless you turn and become like the little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, humbles himself. Woe unto you. Their ego is what consumes the Chaldeans. Jesus says this, therefore, whoever humbles himself like a child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. Whoever gives a loan to the poor gives a loan to who? To me. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes who? Welcomes me. Seems like Jesus had a different perspective, didn't he? Even the disciples were concerned with their position in the kingdom. What we should be concerned with is not a position to obtain, but rather a new mind, a new framework. That by which we will no longer strive for something, but rather pursue someone. I heard a pastor say this this week. It's a problem when we say we are better at something than someone else. But the next level of our pride's manifestation is when we point out others' mistakes without even talking about ourselves. See, our pride has taken a front seat to what the Lord is doing in our lives. Our areas of service have become areas where we can posture. Our churches have become literally billboards for others to see and show how good we are. And the Lord says, is this about you or is it about me? And before we say, well, well, Jesus made it about himself, here's how he did that. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Habakkuk shows us that the way to judgment is taking advantage Of others. And Jesus shows us that the way to his kingdom is by serving others. Church, don't miss this. Are we going to align with the Chaldeans or are we going to align with Jesus? Are we going to stop the cycle? Come on forward, y'all. Are we going to stop the cycle of injustice and oppression or are we going to perpetuate it? Come on, we got a choice to make, church. Pride is the root of this problem. It is the root of these woes. How many know that it's time for us to humble ourselves? How many know it's time for us to be real and not be right? How many know that? Look, if the church is gonna do a work, it has to be through humility. It has to be through him and not through us. Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.